A suggestion is made by the divine soliloquy. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? God's friends are permitted to know his secrets because they are his friends. Abraham is regarded by God as having a right to know what was about to be done. There is biblical backing for that in Psalm chapter 25 verse 4 and Amos chapter 3 verse 7. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to get into further detail on our Prophecies of the Bible study, and we're going to start into that right after this. Welcome once again to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore. Thank you for joining me today once again. Go to my website at connectingthegap.net. All of my podcasts are listed there. You can also subscribe to those on your favorite podcasting platform. I also have a YouTube channel and all of my podcasts are uploaded there each week as well, along with many more Bible studies from the past that are not on my podcast channel. And also my blog. You can get all of that at connectingthegap.net. You can also subscribe to my blog as well. Thank you guys once again for joining me. As I said earlier, we are continuing our study on prophecies of the Bible. And we're working our way from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And we're talking a lot about the prophecies that have already been fulfilled. And then, of course, along the way, we're going to be running across a lot of prophecies that are fulfilled yet to the completeness. And so we're just trying to work our way through all of this. We've reached Genesis chapter 17. So if you have your Bible, you can get that out and join me today in Genesis 17. And we're going to pick up where we left last week. Last week we was talking a little bit about what's kind of considered the Abrahamic covenant. It was all the covenants that God had given to Abraham about if Abraham was going to do what God had asked him to do. God gave him about five different things, four to five different things that he wanted him to do. And if he did that, then God was going to do a bunch of things for Abraham. And we went through all of those items last week of the things that Abraham was going to be blessed with if he was to follow what God's plan was for Abraham's life and for his family. And because Abraham did that, we are all in existence today as we are all descendants of Abraham. You can go back to last week's podcast and catch up on all of that if you was not able to listen to that. We're going to go ahead and get into this week, starting in Genesis chapter 17, talking about Israel's God. We're going to be in verse 7 and 8. It says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That's Genesis 17:7 7 through 8. The Lord repeated his promise to give all the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants, and once again, he added something else to the mix. He would be the God of Abraham and his descendants throughout all generations. No matter what, he would keep his covenant, and he never would turn his back on Abraham's descendants. At times, Israel has been an evil nation. Idolatry and unbelief have filled that land. On at least two occasions, God let foreigners destroy the nation. And those foreigners were in the form of Babylon and Rome. But God is faithful and he's never ceased to be Israel's God. Christians sin, but that doesn't mean God will break his promise to save them. We all have that promise within each of us. If we give our lives to Christ, we give our lives to God, and we start treading down that path that he set before us, he never fails us. He will always forgive us of our sins if we are humble to him and ask him to come inside and to cleanse us from what we have done. The word everlasting means forever. Whether it is everlasting life, as in John chapter 3 verse 16 talks about, or an everlasting covenant, as Genesis 17, 7 through 8 talks about. If God can break an everlasting covenant, Christians may not have everlasting life. If God did not keep his covenant in Genesis, why would we think that he would keep his covenant he gave to us in John 3.16? But Christians do have everlasting life, and that land, regardless of what a lot of people think, is Israel's forever. God gave all of the land of Canaan to Israel, 
the Arabs and their Palestinian allies are trying to take control of Israel and Jerusalem piece by piece, and many world leaders often try to help them. But God said that all of the land belonging to the Abrahamic offspring is Israel. Here's a few reasons why I believe that Israel will receive the promised land. Number one, God knows the future and he will not cast Israel away. That's stated in Romans chapter 11 verses 1 through 2. God is faithful and he will not break his covenants. That is stated in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 44 and 45 and Psalms 89, 30 through 37. The third reason, God is forgiving and full of mercy. You can read about that in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 37, and Romans 11, 30 through 32. Also, the gifts of God can't be taken back. And you can read about that in Romans chapter 11, verse 29. In spite of the fact that Israel has returned to the land in unbelief, this prophecy is constantly being fulfilled. The relationship between God and Israel is not what it should be, but things will change when the Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah at his second coming. That will start the millennium, and they will occupy all of the land God promised to them. God will always be Israel's God. God's unconditional covenants depend upon God, not Israel. And as we know back in the, the last presidency that we just had with President Trump, that he moved the capital back to Jerusalem and that the United States recognized Jerusalem once again as the capital of Israel. And in my belief, I really feel that that is part of fulfilling all of this prophecy that Israel is going to have all of their land back in the end time when it does come around to that. And the United States is taking a little bit of a part in that. Now, I'm hoping that with this new presidency that that does not get reversed. But we do know that God has has spoken this over Israel that they will get this land and so I really I don't see that being reversed but even if it does they're still going to get it back eventually because God has stated that it, that it will happen and so we've actually been able to see some of this prophecy with our own eyes here just in the last few years in Genesis chapter 17 verse 19 it continues it says then God said no Sarah your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. That was Genesis seventeen nineteen. God's promise to give the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants could be fulfilled only by Abraham having a child. When his wife Sarah decided she could not conceive, she suggested that Abraham father a child by her maidservant Hagar. Abraham did as she suggested and Ishmael was born. That was a great thing for an 86-year-old man, but as it goes, that was not what God had intended. That was Abraham taking his own destiny into his own hands. How many times have we done that? Taken our own destiny into our own hands, and how has that worked out? Well, God appeared to Abraham and announced that his wife Sarah would indeed have a baby. It would be a male child. His name would be Isaac, and God's covenant would be renewed with this child and his descendants. Abraham even asked God to accept Ishmael and let the everlasting covenant for possession of the land go through him. If God had agreed, the land would have gone to the Arabs. But God said no. You can read about that in Genesis 17, 18-21. Later, Abraham fathered several sons by his wives, his concubines, and their servants. God did bless all of them, but the covenant he made with Abraham was only to pass through Isaac. God often provided signs so people can remember and know that he made covenants. Here are a few signs that God has given for existing covenants that we know of today. There was the covenant with Noah. That sign is the rainbow. And I think we talked about this a, a few weeks ago when we was going through Noah, talking about some covenants God made with him. The rainbow is not transgender. It's not gay. The rainbow was put there because God said that he would never flood the complete earth again like he did during Noah's time. He has kept that promise to this day. That's in Genesis 9, 12 through 17. There was also the covenant with Abraham. The sign for that was circumcision. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 11. There's also the covenant with Moses, and the sign for that one was Sabbath. And you can read about that in Exodus 31, 13. There's also the new covenant with the church in Israel, and that's the communion cup. That's in Luke 22, verse 20. 
Those who oppose Israel need to pay attention to God's attitude toward that nation. When they set themselves against Israel, they are setting themselves against God, as we can see here in this next information that I'm going to share with you. Here is how God refers himself in the Bible. He refers to himself as the God of Abraham, and he used it in the Bible 16 times. He refers to himself as God of Isaac, done that eight times. 22 times he referred himself to the God of Jacob. 108 times he referred to himself the Lord God of Israel. And 203 times in the Bible he called himself the God of Israel. When Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, the portion of this prophecy that pertains to Isaac was fulfilled. The remainder is continuously being fulfilled as generation to generation passes us by. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 18, God gives a blessing for all. And those scriptures say, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. The inhabitants of two cities that existed in Abraham's lifetime were particularly very evil. They were sinful and wicked. So God decided to destroy them. But he had a special relationship with Abraham, and that prompted a question. Should I hide my intentions from Abraham, since I have promised that he will become a great nation and a source of blessing to all people? God revealed his plan to Abraham, and then he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's descendants eventually became the nation of Israel. During the millennium, Israel will be the great nation predicted in the Bible. All the earth was blessed when Abraham's descendant named Jesus died for the sins of the world. More blessings will be realized at Jesus' second coming. Those in covenant with God have a special relationship with God. We now push on into Genesis to chapter 22, verses 15 through 18. Here Abraham passes with flying colors. This scripture says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. In these scriptures, we see that God had a special relationship with Abraham, but he still decided to test him by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. With simple childlike faith, Abraham was about to obey when God stopped him. God could see that Abraham was willing to go all the way, and that was enough. He hadn't intended for Isaac to be killed. The angel of the Lord appeared and told Abraham that his willingness to obey would be rewarded. Israel would become a very powerful nation, one that would occupy the territory of its enemies. I have thought many times about this story in the Bible, and I know you guys probably have as well. And it's kind of hard to imagine a father or a parent actually taking their child as God commanded him to, and to put that child up as a sacrifice, knowing in, in Abraham's mind he had to be reminiscing over the past when God kept telling him that you're one of your children, you're going to be blessed through this child, this child's going to be the leader of many nations, and this child ended up being Isaac, whom then God wanted him to kill on that altar. I'm sure that Abraham was so confused during all of that, but the whole fact of the matter is he had such faith in God that he was willing to do whatever it was that God asked him to do because in his mind he knew that God had a plan and a path and that he needed to obey in order for God's plan to take place during his lifetime. And so there is a, a ton of reason there that Abraham should have been rewarded greatly for that test that he passed because a lot of us, I don't think, actually could have ever been able to do that. Merrill F. Unger once said, Abraham's passing the severest test of faith with flying colors called forth the most solemn ratification of the covenant indicated by six points. Number one, there were the appearance and voice of the pre-incarnate Christ or the eternal word with God who was God. 
as in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and Genesis 22, 11. Number two, this constituted a second appearance, deity doubly honoring the occasion. Number three, the covenant was sealed with the most solemn declaration, swearing by himself there being none greater. That's in Psalm 105, 9. Number four, it clearly intimated that Abraham had done what God asked him, namely to offer his only son as a burnt offering. And number five, it expanded the scope of covenant blessing. In the earliest enunciation of the promises, Abraham was assured that he individually would be a source of world blessing. In verse 17 of Genesis chapter 22, it says, Now it is in thy seed, repeated to Isaac and Jacob. It promised victory over enemies. The number of Abraham's descendants was continually and constantly growing. All the nations were blessed at the first coming of Jesus. Israel will possess the promised cities and territories at the second coming of Jesus and continue through the millennium. We're going to cut this off for this week here at this point, And we will pick this back up again next week as we work our way through Genesis and through everything that God worked with with Abraham. As you can tell, Abraham had a huge part in what's existent today. He has a huge part in that. And God worked tremendously throughout all of Abraham's life, and there is so much documented in Genesis on the covenants between Abraham and God. And as we started out, we started out in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and with Noah. Those were kind of smaller stories. Those did start things, and there were covenants put to place during those times. But with Abraham, everything was expanded so much more. So we're going to continue on into this next week as we get closer to getting into Isaac and Jacob and all the other ones that are going to be thrown into the mix as we continue our study on the prophecies of the Bible. This is a study based on a study by Damon Duck. And we will pick this up next week here on Connecting the Gap. Again, don't forget to go to my website, connectingthegap.net. have lots of different podcasts on there, my YouTube channel and my blog. And all of these are updated weekly. Subscribe on your favorite podcasts. Please share and uh, help spread the word of Jesus Christ to those that may have never heard or maybe need to rededicate them lives or just need to learn more about God and about the Bible and who he is in our lives. As I go today, don't forget that God's word never fails us. God's word has stood the test of time. And through Jesus' death on the cross, he has connected the gap. Thank you guys for joining me. I'll be back again next week.